Today, we're wrapping up what is called the Ephesian household table, the household rules for Christian households. And at first, I was going to call this workers and employers, um, just because you got to admit, in our day and age, that sounds a lot better, right? Um, But I figured, you know, in our modern day, there's really no equivalent to slaves and masters, no direct equivalent, but there are some principles that we learn from this relationship. Um, So the title, Servants and Masters, is not very culturally sensitive, but because of that reason, I think it's important to face slavery head on, to answer the doubters and skeptics who discount scripture because it gives instructions to slaves and masters. Maybe you've heard that, but the Bible talks about slavery. Uh, Yeah, it does, but not the way you think. Paul does not condone slavery. He disciples rather Christians that are bond servants or masters on how to behave now that they've come to Christ. How do you live in a world that has within its fabric the system of slavery? And so the gospel brought equality and dignity to every person in the sight of God, slaves and masters. And as a result, as the gospel spread, it began to undermine the institution of slavery everywhere it was preached. The gospel transforms society. And so as we live out as Christians, the teaching of the apostles, we see that God uses it to dismantle things that were never his to begin with. There is a book of the Bible in the New Testament that is actually written to a slave owner, Philemon. It is in the New Testament because what we find is his his slave, Onesimus, that ran away. He escaped, but in his uh, time of being away, he met Paul. He received Jesus. And Philemon lived in Colossae, where there was a church, and he was a Christian as well. So Paul writes this letter and sends Onesimus, the runaway slave, back to his master with a strong message to receive him back as a brother. And if you read it, you will see that Paul is definitely not into mistreating those that are slaves. Slavery died out in the Western world due to the influence of Christianity. It was Christianity that put an end to the slave trade in the United States, as well as Great Britain, and is why we are without it in our society today, um, in its formal sense. The kind of slavery that took place in the United States during the colonial period was clearly condemned by Scripture. If you read the Bible, you would know that it was wrong. Uh, In 1 Timothy 1.8, it says, Now we know that the law is good. We're speaking of the Old Testament law. If anyone uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law was not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers for murderers, for the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers. Notice that. The law was laid down for men like enslavers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And so this title or this noun, enslavers, is literally a man-stealer who would capture or kidnap a person in order to make them slaves or sell them into slavery. What does the Old Testament have to say to them? Well, in Exodus 21, 16, whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. That's some serious stuff. So if you want to know what the Bible says about slavery or enslavers, boom, there 
it is. You're not allowed to do what um, people during the colonial period did when they went over to Africa and brought um, people over against their will and made them slaves and sold them. In the book of Revelation, being fresh on my mind, is another mention of slavery. You see, there, was a, there is a great city called Babylon the Great. It's a wicked city, and God destroys it. One of the evils that was in the city is slavery. In Revelation 18.11, And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their, tar- their cargo anymore, cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, and all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, and all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze and iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, and fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves, that is, human souls. Human souls. The person's life essentially is stolen from them. Their will is taken away. Being kidnapped and being abused by the buyer. If he didn't know, today there is a slave trade. And it's not legal, but from reports I've heard, um, white American men are the um, main connoisseurs of the sexual slave trade. And we heard that from Edward Amaya when he was here. Um, And so there are those that are out there fighting against it and trying to save these kids. But God did not create humans to become slaves. You don't see that in the garden. He creates men free. He didn't institute slavery. Scripture places limitations and boundaries on the practice of slavery, and Scripture also instructs us not to become slaves if you have the choice. In 1 Corinthians 7.20, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not become concerned about it. Um, But if you can gain your freedom, Avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord is a bondservant, as a bondservant is a freed man in the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when he was called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. And so we were created to be free, and then Christ saved us to be free from sin and slavery to serve him in him alone. So in this day that Paul writes, there were many who were in willing servitude in order to survive and make a living. Somebody who was poor, and didn't have a home. I mean, we've all seen it with people on the street holding a sign, we'll work for food, which I don't know if they really do or not. Maybe you guys know. But what if a rich person came by and they, they said, hey, I have a nice guest room. In fact, it's a guest house. Why don't you come and live here and work for me? You'll be able to make a living and you'll get off the street. Now, you can imagine if you had a wife and kids, that would be pretty appealing. And in Paul's day, this was fairly common. Those that couldn't afford to live on their own, those that were in debt, um, became the servant of someone in order to pay for uh, their needs. Perhaps you've entered into a loan to purchase your home, and you don't own it. The lender does. You know, we we all know how it works. We say, I own my house, but we don't really own our house. The bank does. And over the course of 30 years, you're going to pay it back three times the amount that you borrowed, right? I remember the first house we bought, and I'm looking at those numbers going, what? 
then it becomes yours one day. And you'll be free from that binding agreement that makes you a type of bond servant. In Proverbs 22, 7, it says the, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave of the lender. And so the form of slavery maybe has changed, but the willingness to bind yourself to a financial agreement has not. In Paul's day, um, today that, that kind of thing is separated quite a bit. Uh, you know, we have laws and we have, um, you know, it's not like the bank lives in your house. But in Paul's day, the slave was considered part of the household. They actually lived with the master and his family. And so this position, although it didn't make them equal like their children, uh, they were subservient. They were considered legal property of their masters during their servitude. But when they accepted Christ, slaves received a brand new identity in Jesus as bond servants of Christ, and they were united with their fellow Christians, especially masters. In Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so you can imagine how it would work when everybody went to church on Sunday morning and um, the master sitting on one row and the slave and his family sitting on the other row and they're being treated exactly the same. There is no difference. Well, first we see in verses five through eight some instructions for Christian slaves. Slaves and masters, as we're going to see today, are both ethically responsible before God. You know, today you find this teaching of oppressor versus oppressed, and the oppressor loses their rights, and the oppressed, uh, they have all the rights. Um, but that's not the way Scripture puts, puts it out here. Slaves and masters are both ethically responsible before God. Equal members in the body of Christ. And so in verse 5, it says, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers. Well, you'll notice here that the word is translated bond servant. In the Hebrew, there's a word, abed, for slave, and in the Greek, doulos. It also means slave, but it's translated differently in our Bibles depending on the context and the historical um, meaning of what it was to be a slave in the Greek, uh, the Greco-Roman culture. Here, it says bond servant because that is the nature of the relationship. It's also translated servant and slave. In the Old Testament, one might become a slave voluntarily as well as the New Testament, to escape poverty, to pay off a debt. But there were also those who became slaves involuntarily, by birth, by being captured and spared in battle, or by judicial sentence. But here's what we learn. The Old Testament law provides protection and provisions for slaves and for their eventual release. And that was very different from the world in which slavery abound. In the preface to the ESV version, it says this, in New Testament times, doulos is often best described as a bondservant, that is someone in the Roman Empire officially bound under contract to serve his master for seven years, except for those in Caesar's household in Rome where they were contracted for 14 years. When the contract expired, the person was freed, given his wage that had been saved by the master and officially declared a freedman. So that's the kind of slavery that Paul is writing to. Slavery was so common in the Roman Empire, it's been estimated that 60 million slaves were present at any one time 
slave uh, masters employed, doctors, educators, architects. You know, these are all things we don't think about. Um, when we think of slave, you think of perhaps somebody that doesn't have the right kind of clothing or who is, um, you know, not really respected in society, but the slaves in the Roman Empire were people that were respected. Every household was touched in some way by slavery. And so when Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, one third of the population of Ephesus was estimated to be slaves at the time. Many in the church were either slaves or former slaves. But I want to read to you out of Kent Hughes's commentary here. He talks a little bit about what it was like. He said, very few ever reached old age as slaves. Slave owners were releasing slaves at such a rate that Augustus Caesar introduced legal restrictions to curb the trend. Despite this, inscriptions indicate that almost 50% of slaves were freed before the age of 30. What is more, while the slave remained in his master's possession, he could own property, including other slaves. And completely controlled his own property so that he could invest and save to purchase his own freedom. Slaves regularly were accorded the social status of their owners. And so there was a benefit in many ways to the slaves that they were also higher in society because of who their owner was. Regarding outward appearance, it was usually impossible to distinguish a slave from free persons. A slave could be a custodian, a salesman, or a CEO. Many slaves lived separately from their owners. Finally, selling oneself into slavery was commonly used as a means for, of obtaining Roman citizenship and gaining an entrance into society. So again, we're kind of removing the misconceptions that we have about slavery in the Bible times compared to the slavery that we have experienced in our country, in our, our, our country's past. Paul tells the bondservants to obey their earthly masters. You see, although a slave may become a Christian and have a new identity in Christ, they might be tempted to disregard their master's authority, saying, oh, you're a brother in Christ, so, you know, I don't need to respect you. But being under Christ's authority does not mean that believers are free of earthly authority, as we've been learning in Ephesians. Whatever authority is that God has us under, we are supposed to give them respect in honor of the Lord. Here they're told to obey. And it's the same word for when children obey their parents, um, to listen to and follow instructions. So it's yielding one's will to the command of the authority unless it's a direct command to disobey God. There, there is a time when it's okay to disobey, and that is when it goes against the teaching of Scripture um, in Acts 4.19. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than, than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And, and so they were saying, you know, we were sent out by Christ to share the gospel. And if you tell us not to preach the gospel, we have to do it anyway. You know, and so there are things where there are times where we have to disobey the authority in our life. Paul gives six qualities to obedience here. These qualities become the Christian work ethic. And so here's some of the principles we learn about if you, maybe you're not a slave, but your work feels like it's slavery. <laughs> Every Monday morning when you get up, oh man, gotta go back to work. I'm a slave to my job. Here's some qualities for you. To obey with fear and trembling, which means a Christian respect for the master because of his position, because of his authority. Um, there are times in the Bible where fear and trembling is used of respecting human authority. There is one time where Paul sends Titus 
to um, the Corinthians and they received him in such a way. It says in 2 Corinthians 7, 15, and his affection for you is even greater. Titus, his affection for the Corinthians is greater as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. Though that's a phrase used of God, this is not in equality of fear of God, but rather with respect towards men. Disrespectful workers tarnish their witness. That was true then and it's true now. If you disrespect your boss, it has an impact on the gospel. In 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 2, let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. So maybe replace, respect your boss so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. But also... Not only respect of authority in the workplace, but also a sincere heart. This is the second thing we see. A heartfelt obedience out of pure motivation of benevolence. And so what does that mean? Well, when you're doing your job, it's not just an outward show. It's not doing your job with a secret motive. It's not being two-faced, where, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, and then, what a jerk, you know, when they walk away. A sincere heart means having integrity, displaying faithfulness, doing things for the good of the business, for the good of your other co-workers. You know, I have a great example in my life, and my dad, he, he was such a, a great guy, you know, and represented this very well. He and his coworkers came up with a brand new uh, welding method, and it was um, able to be trademarked, you know. And so instead of the guys getting together and say, hey, let's become the owners of this patent and become rich, they decided to give it to everybody. That's a sincere heart. The willingness to not be the one that takes all the glory, that gets all the goods, but rather is looking for the good of others around them. The third thing is as you would Christ. Jesus is your ultimate master. Work is really done for Jesus, no matter what your job is. What we find here is you are working for Christ. I mean, yeah, you're working for your family so that you can take care of them. And, and uh, you're working, hopefully, um, it's nice when you can work and it's your calling as well. And it's nice when you can enjoy it, but really when it comes down to it, work is an opportunity for worship. When you do your job for Jesus, it sanctifies your common job as a service to the king. And that's good news because many of us don't look at our jobs that way. Um. You know, on Sunday morning, it's, it's great to hear the word and go, amen, and agree, and, and say that is good and that is right, but Monday morning is the day that you actually put it into practice. The real test is not having the right answer. The real test is when you live it out. And so when you go back to work, will you do it for Jesus? Will you do it as an act of worship? 
You know, this will transform your view of your job no matter what it is. I remember being convicted of this when I was at Bible college and my job was to clean the men's dorm bathrooms. That was my job. I had to make some extra money and that was the only job available, so I began doing the job of cleaning toilets and showers and urinals and it's amazing what can end up where, but you know, you just got to do it. And uh, the thing God convinced, convicted me of is you're doing this for me. You're doing this for me. I mean, it was a little easier right at first because I'm at Bible college. You got to be spiritual. So you got to keep that in mind. But, you know, it's true of all of us. So I started doing it for the Lord. And it was kind of funny because um, one day I came out of the bathroom and there was a line of guys. And I was like, whoa, what are you guys doing? They're all, we're waiting for you to get done. Every time you clean the bathroom, it's actually clean. So we hold it (laughs) so we can sit down for a while, you know. (laughs) I was like, okay, that's more than I want to know. But it becomes a spiritual act of worship, you know. The things that you do for the Lord become high-quality things that represent Him. Do people see Jesus in your work? Well, the fourth thing we see here is not by the way of eye service or people pleasers. Maybe you remember PE class. Everybody's doing sit-ups or push-ups and the the PE teacher's walking around through the room and you're like, one, two, and the teacher walks by you facing the other direction and you just stay, three, four. (laughs) That's eye service. When we're at work and we're only working hard when the boss is present, but uh, other than that, we find time to not work. It means that we don't seek the approval of man. We don't do it for a reward, but we do it to be seen by God. Well, it goes on in the rest of verse 6, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will, as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. This section I separated because I believe that this is true of all believers, whether you be a boss or a worker, whether someone is a slave or a master because it says bond servants of Christ. So the fifth quality we see in obedience is as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, from the heart. So that if we're doing the job for Christ, that it actually is flowing from a heart that understands You're doing this before the throne of God. Now that you're a bondservant of Christ, you're called to do God's will. You're called to be his servant. From the heart here means literally from the soul. So in contrast to eye service kind of work, we're called to soul service. That'd be a cool patch to put on the back of a leather jacket. Soul service, you know. Well, the sixth thing we see, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. This means serving with a good attitude, willingly and without complaining, with good will. Which means doing kind and loving acts, kind and loving acts. Would that be a way you could describe your work? Kind and loving acts. Well, our zeal, our eagerness at work should be to bless the Lord and secondarily to understand that others will be blessed and to do the best we can. 
for the good of other people. And this last week, or actually just a couple days ago, I went to urgent care to get an x-ray on my foot. You know, I have a sore foot, been walking on it for six months. I don't know. Guys never listen. Go to the doctor. No. So, you know, fifth metatarsal on the outside, just been aching and burning and hurting and all kinds of things. And so I went in and got my x-ray. The young woman behind the counter was very service-oriented. And this is good news in the medical world because, uh, you know, to find if somebody who's very service-oriented is tough. And so I check in and then she's like, would you like some coffee? Points me to a Keurig. Or would you like some water? There's a little refrigerator with drinks. It was like juices and all sorts of things. And, and then she was like, would you like a wheelchair? It's like, yes. <laughs> that would be totally, con- and then I said, no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. And, and she's like, come on, let me provide you with something. I'm trying to, trying to provide good care here, you know? But I was impressed. That zeal, the eagerness to bless, to do good, Have you lost that edge? Have you lost that heart? This is not meant to be done for man, but for Christ. Knowing, it says here, whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. And it's talking about that day when Jesus Christ gives rewards to those who were faithful the way that you did your job will be considered when he's giving rewards. So anyone that does good, well, what does it mean to do good? Well, this word good means pertaining to meeting a high standard of quality that is useful and beneficial. That after you're done with your job, you can sign the name of Christ to it and say that, good. One day you will stand before the Lord and you'll give an answer for how you lived, but also how you worked. God is aware of your quality service to others. He's a rewarder of good work. How cool is that? So not only do you do it as worship, but God is watching and one day he will give rewards. So we don't work just for a paycheck. And if you find yourself thinking that, wrong. We actually work for the Lord. Yeah, sometimes we do have to make changes because the paycheck's too small and our bills are too big, whatever it may be. But We also work for God's retirement plan. When you think about your retirement plan on earth, you know, how's that going? Some of us have a great retirement plan. Some of us have no retirement plan. As I often say, my retirement plan is is in heaven. (laughs) You know, God's retirement plan. In Matthew 6, 19, 21, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's why we don't work for a paycheck. That's why we don't work for an earthly retirement plan. We store up our treasures in heaven. Well, this is true. It says, whether he is bondservant or free, both slaves and slaves who've been set free. In verse 9, we see the last part, instructions for Christian masters. Treat your bondservants or workers in the way that glorifies Jesus. And it says, masters, do the same to them. And stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Now, this phrase, do the same to them, would have been shocking in Paul's day. Outrageous. That a first century master would have to do the same as a slave 
to a slave? What does this mean? Well, it means giving reciprocal respect and service, love, doing good to those under their management and not taking advantage of them, treating their slaves or today employees the way that you want to be treated. And so stop your threatening, Paul says. The way that masters could threaten slaves back then was to harm them. First century masters had the power of life and death over their slaves. They could beat them, they could imprison them, and they could sell them to a harsher master. Paul's saying, give up all the harsh treatment. All the harsh things that you could do to punish your slaves, no longer dehumanize them, manipulate them, or use fear to control them. Don't use your superior position to bully others under you. I find it interesting when people were hearing the gospel being preached by John the Baptist, and they were repenting and getting baptized, um, Check this out. There were, there were some men in authority uh, that he had some instruction to. Hey, if you really want to change, then do these things. So it says this in Luke 3.12. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. The soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be content with your wages. Greed can really get a hold of people that are in charge in the workplace. It's unfitting for a follower of Christ to fall prey to greed. In James 5, 4, it says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Uh Uh-oh. Man, it's so important to take care of your workers. Pay your employees. A worker is worthy of their hire. Also, in a position of leadership, we learn to follow Christ's example, who is willing to serve everybody. It says he became the servant of all. Two big reasons are given here by Paul for masters to obey. The first is knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. So he's telling the masters, hey, you see that servant over there? He has a master that's bigger than you. You better watch out. One day you're going to have to answer to him. You're just like an (laughs) undermaster. You're not the master. Only God is that. Bosses and masters will be accountable to the true master. But not only that, the master himself is a bondservant to the master above. Well, the second reason masters should listen to these instructions is that there is no partiality with God. No partiality with God. Maybe if you've ever reached a position where you have authority or you're paid more or you're respected more because of that position, you learn that people tend to give you a little bit more respect or more privilege Um, of some sort. And you get used to this idea that, well, because of who I am, people treat me better, and I expect that. God does not show favoritism. He's not going to say, oh, you are the CEO of that company. Well, I'm going to judge you a little less harsh because you deserve it. Nope. He says, I'm going to judge you the same way I'm going to judge the slave. It would be injustice for God to treat us differently. In Leviticus 19.15, it says, you shall do no injustice in court. 
You shall not be partial to the poor. That means giving the oppressor rights and privileges. Um, Or defer to the great, giving the rich special privileges. But in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. And if that is God's instruction on how to be just in this world, then how much more does that reflect his character when we face him one day? And so though you may be used to special treatment based on your social status or your affluence, when you stand before the Lord, that means nothing. And so, application. How does this translate to my life today? And uh, I want to wrap this up with three thoughts. First, Bring gospel freedom to those in bondage to slavery today. Everybody in bondage from sin, bondage to Satan, bondage to alcohol or drugs, bondage to earthly masters. The gospel is the only hope that you have to offer. In Luke 4, 18, Jesus' ministry had this liberating aspect to it, it said that, that, that about him, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering a sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Everywhere that Jesus goes, he's freeing captives And so everywhere we go and we preach the gospel, Jesus is still freeing captives through the gospel message. It will shatter the world's institutions. It will free those that are being taken advantage of by the enemy. And so as a church, we continue that ministry today And we can even partake in the freeing of those that are being held in captive today. Don't go on those pornographic websites where this kind of sexual slave trade is being promoted. Just by you clicking on something, you're taking part in it. But rather look for those like Edward Amaya, who was here recently, and support the ministry, pray for them, become involved. Well, the second thing I would encourage you with is live your life as a bond servant of Christ and do not let the fear of man master you. As believers, man, we got a new identity. And so whether we're in charge or whether we are under some, some boss that's not the way we would hope they would be. We are bond servants of Christ. Thirdly, grow in your Christian work ethic. Maybe beginning this week by your job becoming a spiritual act of worship. Every, I had a friend, you know, good friend, believer who's garbage man, you know, every garbage can. That's for you, Jesus. <laughs> Here we go. Cleaning up the world for you, Jesus. <laughs> Let your work not only be a spiritual act of worship, but also a testimony to what happens when Jesus transforms a life. Well, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word and pray today, Lord, we would take these things to heart. The, the great principles that you taught people that we're in charge of others, that we're subjected to others. Lord, you still called us all to honor you, worship you, and represent you in whatever situation we're in. And so, Lord, we lift up our situation to you today. The job that we have, the boss that we have, or the people that we lead, Lord, teach us to do it in a way that honors you. Forgive us for becoming like the world. God, we repent now. 
and pray that you would lead us forward and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.